All right, here we are. We're back. It is the Dr. Perlman Podcast. And this is going to be an introduction to the first in studio, if you will, which was actually just uh, recorded in the uh, home of yours truly. And my guest was uh, uh, an old uh, classmate of mine and uh, a colleague, Dr. Taylor Davis, who we went to chiropractic school together. And he's got a really cool story to share, uh, not just about uh, as we get into his Parsonage Turner syndrome diagnosis in one in his shoulder, that uh, that could have seemingly um, you know been devastating to his career as a chiropractor and as an avid golfer, but he has a, a cool story in which he went through not just the progression of the pain and the symptoms and the way it manifested, but the experience within the realm of healthcare trying to get the, the right diagnosis when seeking answers from uh, recommended surgeries to recommended tests to, to time and rehab and various diagnosis to then settle on something to have the answer like this is what it was. And we also talk a lot about um, the various aspects of chiropractic regarding not just pain inhibition, but also wellness. Um, you know, consistency and frequency of care when it comes to uh, different um, types of injuries and different clientele, if you will. You know, what might be appropriate for somebody might not be appropriate for someone else. And we talk about that. We talk about the role of rehab within not just chiropractic, but rehab in terms of functioning, excuse me, uh, not functional medicine, but, you know, uh, being optimal, like having an optimal functioning uh, ergonomic, you know, body to prevent injury and to understand, um, we hope to shed light on the efficacy, not just of chiropractic, but some of the, uh, the misunderstood concepts. And, uh, we shed some light on modern day chiropractic education and, uh, hopefully you find it fun. This is a much more, uh, casual conversation, uh, podcast. It's definitely going to be different. Like I said, it's the DFW uh, conversations over coffee edition, if you will, where we're going to get local uh, small businesses and, and, and just people within the community who have a cool story to tell. And, I, and it's one of my goals to give people the platform to share their story, to share uh, what they may have that could be beneficial to the rest of humanity. What we're all about here, we're all about health, wellness, truth, and love. You know, hopefully you gain some insight and uh, information that you find useful. Uh, but without me further uh, rambling on, this is me and Dr. Taylor Davis. Coming to the Dr. Perlman podcast, and I just want to say thank you. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, I hope that this podcast provides you with some education, information, or maybe some inspiration in some way, shape, or form. But at the very least, if you get a little bit of a laugh or smile, then to be honest, I feel good about what I'm doing. Oh, the remnants. Yeah, that coffee's already 10 times better than mine. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. That's right, Michael. We got your back, brother. Yeah. Drinking this light roast with the steam coming off. From Richardson? Yeah. Is where you found them? Yeah. yeah it's at the Richardson Farmer's Market. Now I hassle the guy all the time to come running with me. Oh, really? Yeah. Try and hit up gems. Gems? Yeah. No, like gems, like oh. CrossFit gems or maybe, or something like that. Yeah, I did. Uh, all in my area, like, they, all, yeah. they all closed. We're not, yeah, we're not open right now. Oh, well, I went to one in particular, and I found two trainers plus a desk guy. They were in the middle of something, and I didn't want to bother them, so I left them an email. At the same time, I went into a dance studio, and I left them an email. And it was very, you know, well thought out and just kind of casual. Hey, I'm in the area. If there's anything you think I can ever do, or I'd love to come meet you guys, kind of thing, and no response from any th for either. Any oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I reached out to a bunch of apartment complexes. Same thing, except for one. One was like, "Oh yeah, that'd be great. Let me reach out to our regional manager." Like, <laughs> Sounds good. I'll probably just pop in there and say what's up. Did you know that? <laughs> So now that we're now that we're really going, we're really doing this. It's awesome. Thank, by the way, thanks for coming in. Oh yeah, you got it. Pleasure having you. I didn't even know we were recording. Yet. No, no, we're, we're totally recording. <laughs> uh, this is authentic. This is official. Yeah, 
But uh, you're actually the first guest on the Dr. Perlman podcast to be live in studio, a, uh, AKA or EG, uh, inside the Perlman household. Nice. And you're also the first guest on the DFW Conversations Over Coffee edition. Yeah, this is great coffee. I'm not even, <laughs> yeah, 10 times better than my Costco coffee, <laughs> like I said. Yeah, usually a Costco, Kroger, 7 Eleven. Sorry, you guys. Buying bulk. Shout out, Costco. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we're we're all about boutique, small batch, organic, fair trade. Good you stuff. Know, with the mission. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Like I said, I was listening to the podcast on the way over here. And so what he rebags the coffee and ships it to Africa or what? No, I, I don't know in terms of well, how about this? I know that the process and I don't know how many um farms they're working with, mm -hmm. but I know they're mostly in Mexico, or at least the main ones in Mexico, to my knowledge. And it's that every bag of coffee they, they sell helps support clean water, education, and nutrition for those villages and those kids that would otherwise go without. Oh, so when I think of like the, uh, the, the word like fair trade that you see a lot, like when it comes to coffee, mm -hmm. like he's like the living, he is, Michael is a living epitome. Like he's the example of this, yeah, I am. you know, really taking the time to give back and make sure that the people that are putting in all the hard work don't go without. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Especially as much as my parents go to Mexico, it's definitely good to give back to them. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, uh, were they there last month for a week and a half? And they're going back right before our kids do. Right before she's due. They were like, you know, if she comes early, you know, we'll get back. But uh, if not, we'll <laughs> see her when we get back from Mexico. So, yeah. Uh, where do you, What yeah, part of Mexico do they go to? Uh, so, we typically like... Uh, Cancun. Well, Cancun is where I or we got engaged uh, in Cancun, and then the Riviera Maya is super nice. And then we've been wanting to go to Cabo, and obviously I'm into golf, so Cabo's like the top, like that's where the top golf courses are, just because like the landscape. Yeah. So the chiropractor that I shadowed uh, in Frisco, uh, Doctor Bullet, he that's where he goes and plays. Uh, he does some sort of, uh, which I need to look into. It's like a, uh, it's like a chiropractor getaway in Cabo and he played, that's where he plays is in Cabo. So I, that's where I've been wanting to go for a long time, but I just never made it out there. Dude, so, it's coming. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Soon. Yeah, I know. We're, <laughs> we're going to Broken Bow for the first time in December for like New Year's. And that'll be like our first, that'll be our only vacation this year. Where's Broken Bow? uh south southeast oklahoma okay so it's supposed to be super nice obviously so i mean we'll get into this but yeah so we're the clinic opens up on the 5th in mckinney and then you know our kid is due the 28th of october so back-to-back -back october events and then we're just gonna get going and then obviously we're gonna take off for new year's so uh, that'll be like our one vacation this year so yeah, yeah fun stuff <laughs> Dude, that's exciting. I mean, your wife, Taylor, and that's crazy. Like, so for people who don't know, this is Dr. Taylor Davis. Yeah. I'm, and, yeah. Uh, you know, you all heard the intro. And if not, that means you fast forwarded too much. And, <laughs> <laughs> and not only were we classmates at Parker University, yeah. but uh, he and his wife have a baby on the way. And they're opening up uh, in um, Frisco or McKinney. Maybe, okay, it is. Yeah. So McKinney. we live in Frisco. We've been in Frisco for 20 years wow. or close to that. And it's just like it's boomed. And uh, I was telling somebody actually yesterday at the farmer's market that the only thing that was keeping me in Frisco was a golf course. <laughs> and uh, now that the PGA is coming, we're, we'll be in Frisco. So we're opening up in McKinney just for the location. And as far as like the density of chiropractors goes in Frisco, uh, mm -hmm. we just want to try and get a little bit further north. But uh, yeah, we're, we're going to open up in McKinney. So, but yeah, kid on the way the 28th. So yeah. that's awesome. I know it's crazy. Now, don't tell me that your child's name is potentially even going to have a Taylor no, in it. Not a chance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my uh, all of our family members were like, "You should, you should name her Taylor." And I'm like, I was just like, "Look, so we name our first kid Taylor. What are we going to do when we have another one? We <laughs> we cannot name it Taylor." So we're just like, "We're not." I'm, I I was like, "We're not doing it. Not doing. It. Not happening." Like even if it's a boy, not happening. Yeah, one one going to do it. What, what, what was that? I always wondered, what was that like when you met your wife and you all had the, the same name? Was it just a funny thing? Was yeah, it, it, honestly, I don't remember. I mean, so we met in high school. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we met in high school 
and uh, I had thrown a uh, a spring break party at my house while my, my parents were in Mexico, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, we just hit it off um, and kind of hung out every day that week, and then it kind of just went from there, but honestly, I don't remember. I know, like... Now it'll be different tones. Like if it's if I get like more of like a firm Taylor, so they're probably talking to me. Or they call me Doctor Taylor, which I don't know. I still find kind of weird calling myself Doctor, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they she's just Taylor. It's like a nice, like sweet Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So that's. But yeah, everyone always. I don't. It's never. I mean, I guess we both look, and then that's kind of like the weirdest thing. The first time that it was weird though, when we were in Hawaii on our honeymoon coming back and, uh, or actually no, it was the day after she called the insurance company for some reason to like some for something. And she said her name was Taylor Davis. And that was the first time I was like, oh snap, like that, that that's my name. And like, <laughs> that's her name now too. So that was the, and that was like the day after we got married. That was kind of weird, but yeah, that was it. It was, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, that was always that was always really cool to see like Taylor and Taylor. Yeah, and now the, 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 there's the story, and now you are Doctor Taylor. So yeah, it makes, yeah, it makes it uh, easy to to uh, the, the distinction. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of easy for uh, as far as uh, marketing in our area as well, getting our name out there. Like I was saying at the uh, the the trade days in McKinney that we were at yesterday, it was easy. We're just like, yeah, Taylor and Taylor, and people are like, oh, Taylor and Taylor, that's easy to remember. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's kind of a nice little trademark or whatever you want to call it kind of a plug for the clinic and oh, taylor sure. and taylor so Heck yeah i would never forget that haven't forgotten it no yeah so yeah everyone's always like yeah taylor and taylor so yeah it's kind of it's been kind of nice uh you know there's obviously good and bad mm-hmm. like plane tickets are always an issue they're like oh you <laughs> double booked and they're like no we didn't double book they're like it's taylor and taylor so and they conveniently don't let you put your middle name so they're always like it's always taylor davis and taylor davis so they're like oh you double book that's a problem it's like no look i swear here's my passport here's yeah my yeah license. here's the passports we're not trying to uh <laughs> like yeah yeah we're not trying to just squeeze a free ticket in there <laughs> but yeah it's uh yeah it's been crazy man nine years it's been good though and now we're a kid, new business. It's been a big year. COVID, it's been crazy, but uh, we're making it through. So nice, yeah. And you know, one of the things that you know obviously uh, inspired me not just to do the podcast in terms of health and wellness, but in particular doing it like this here at the house with the camera and everything. It's all about. Um, well, I mean, I feel everybody has a story to tell, mm-hmm. and like that goes without saying. Some more maybe interesting than others. But in particular, when we were in school, uh, well, we'll get into that in a minute um, with the shoulder diagnosis, but you have like a cool background story because you weren't like on track, you know, back in your college days, no. your first choice career to become a chiropractor. No. And here you are. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was uh, it was interesting in that I I always knew I wanted to be a business owner. My, my parents owned a landscape company and... Uh, I, I always knew I wanted to own something and, you know, I always, I always worked from 15 to, I mean, I've never not had a job. I'll put it to you that way. And, uh, nobody, you know, I felt that I was never paid what I was deserved. And, you know, I got into the golf industry when I was, uh, in high school. Uh, I played select soccer for a long time and I'd always get frustrated at people, you know, that they mess up. And so that's when I picked up golf and I was like, if I mess up, it's on me. And uh, so I ended up getting into the golf industry in in high school. What what is, what is that? Sorry to interrupt, but what does that mean getting into the golf industry? So like, just, I guess I thought that I wanted to run a golf course that like maybe buy or build a golf course or something like that. And uh, so I worked at a few country clubs and um my uh i saw how much my head pro was working basically the guy that runs the golf course or at least the golf shop he did the lessons uh 70 hours a week maybe 80 hours a week sun up to sundown six days a week i was like i'm not doing that like that's just not gonna happen especially making maybe fifty thousand a year it's like not happening so you know i I, all what i remember is you know i was laying in bed one night and i was going to unt uh, in Denton 
And uh, the next day I had taken a kinesiology class because I was always into working out, you know, health and fitness or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the next day, I, my kinesiology class, there was a recruiter from Parker that came and uh, I was, you know, I was like, interesting. I knew my parents had gone to a chiropractor, but I have never, I'd never been to a chiropractor. I went one time for my foot. And he was like, yeah, you know, like, you know, like probably just, you know, let it rest. And, you know, it, it did end up, you know, going away or whatever. But um, that the, the only time I'd ever been to a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing some research on YouTube and um, I was listening to your podcast on the way over here. Another plug. And uh, same thing came across. Um, I think it's Dr. Ian, the guy in... Uh, New, New Zealand, Australia, or? Australia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I came across one of his videos on YouTube. Um, I think I got sidetracked. Yeah. A recruiter from Parker came to my kinesiology class in UNT and I went home that night and started looking up YouTube videos and came across Ian, uh, or Dr. Ian or whatever, <laughs> Gonstead chiropractic. And this guy was literally hunched over, like couldn't walk. Like, you know, he was probably six, four and he, he was like, you know, walking into the clinic at probably five, five. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the video just went through kind of his exam and the adjustments. And that was just a rabbit hole of videos. There was one guy that like couldn't breathe and <laughs> he had like all of this like paraspinal edema and he adjusted him and it was just like, <clears throat> and I was like, holy crap, dude, what the heck's going on? So I, uh, I was like, dude, this is like, I want to do that stuff. Like, that looks so cool. I wonder, and, uh, I wonder if any of the, the schools have given <laughs> Dr. Ian any commission. Dude, he needs commission, yeah. man. He need it because it sounded like that last doctor, the same thing. Like, she came across a Dr. Ian video yeah. and was like, rabbit hole to it's like, wait a minute. chiropractor. It's like, you're already knowing maybe you want to be in some kind of a healthcare industry. Then yeah. you see how much you can do. And yeah. then you see this guy and you're like, I can make that big an impact. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, rabbit hole down all of his videos, the, yeah, I mean, I can just, yeah, I, like I can play it in my mind. I'm like, dude, I want to do that stuff. And so I, uh, you know, I was kind of a crap head in high school and college. Like I was a business major, so I didn't study anyway. So I was just like, <laughs> man, it's like, it was going to be easy. I'll just go to chiropractic school or whatever. And they were like, well, you have two geology courses, so you should probably get some like science under your belt. So I was like, yeah, you're probably right. I should probably like get some extra courses or whatever. So I, uh, I ended up finishing at UNT and then I, I went over to the undergrad program and I, did you do the undergrad or no with Dr. Perryman? Yeah. So I did, so I did those courses or whatever. Um, and, uh, that, I mean, I think that honestly was the only reason I was able to get through chiropractic school. Like I, I didn't study in college, high school. I wasn't worried about it. I was just like, you know what? I'll like, I'll pass or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, they were like, nah, I'm like, this is like a doctorate program. I was like, what are you like? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> it's like, like, this is a three and a half year program. And I was like, okay, like, yeah, yeah you're, pr you're probably right. I should probably do some extra courses. <laughs> so I, that's my, that I, I think that's why I made it through chiropractic school. Honestly, was that undergrad program at Parker uh, with Dr. Perryman. Yeah, he probably saved me multiple student loan payments uh, in the future if I didn't take his courses with failing classes through school. So, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know that, not just about Parker with their uh, prerequisite kind of prior to the three and a half year or three yeah. and a quarter year, whatever we want to call it, uh, curriculum at Parker, but that you can actually come from a background like you where you, how much did you get a four year degree prior or were you in the midst of getting a four year Yeah, degree? I had like a semester left and uh, yeah, that was so like, I was like, what the heck am I going to do with a bachelor's in business? Like, mm -hmm. what am I going to do with that? And so I was like, nah, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I'm fine. I'll just transfer over. Uh, but yeah, dude, like that, that was the coolest thing for me that I could enter chiropractic with not having the full bachelor's degree and they like, you know, like they were like, if you do these prereq courses and you, you know, get B's or whatever, um, you know, you'll be able to get into the school. Yeah. And, uh, so I was like, all right, like 
done. I'll like, that's what I'll do. And so that's what I did. And, you know, ended up getting in and, you know, the rest is history. But that, that's the coolest thing for me is that you can have any sort of background and get into chiropractic and kind of find your, you know, if you will, like niche mm-hmm. inside chiropractic. And that's like your foundation or whatever. Um, so for me, chiropractic is my foundation, but I have like, I am obviously into more of a rehab based clinic. Uh, I like, obviously I love exercise, uh, but obviously chiropractic is like the foundation of my clinic. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and that's like, that's, you know, seven and a half years worth of college right there. Yeah. And again, like for the people that don't know, like chiropractic is not a certificate. Chiropractic is not a three and a half year degree. Chiropractic yeah. is about a seven and a half to eight year, depending on which way you look at it, when you encompass your bachelor's degree. Yeah. And again, even if you have some prerequisite courses leading to the three and a half year chiropractic degree, there's another, that's about four plus years yeah. of schooling there. And again, you're taking a super high load course, uh, heavy loaded courses, uh, accelerated kind of track, I guess we could look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should be at least five years. Mm -hmm. Like you're look like an average court, like that's how I explained to my parents, like an average college course load is 15 hours. We were taking 25 to 35 hours in three months. That's right. Like that it's, it was insane. And that was the biggest thing for me, like going back to the whole, undergrad program at Parker, like I had no intentions of studying. I thought I was just going to go through the program and it would be like all cool. And, you know, I just get through, but come to find out, like you have to learn, like I had to learn in the undergrad program at Parker. Like I had to learn how to study. I had to learn the bones. I had to learn the muscles. I had to learn the physiology before I even got into the program. And so that's what made, you know, anatomy with dark, like I, I studied, I can't say that I didn't study, but I definitely, you know, breezed through anatomy fairly easily because of that undergrad program at Parker. Oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Those, uh, repetitions when looking at things like anatomy and physiology, I think some people think that they're, they have this knack and that there's, uh, some people are smarter than others. No. I mean, I'm sure we could match up. Uh, or sorry, test every individual's IQs that went through fucking yeah. <laughs> grad school, but it's the repetition and yeah. the hard work and just taking ownership of it that in the end will get you through those kinds of classes. And yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's the same with, I think the body and there's nothing better. Like it was crazy. Cause like I, I explain chiropractic to people and getting it like the reason to get adjusted is time and repetition mm-hmm. and like not even thinking about it. My wife on our website put time and repetition like that was like a slogan that she put and i think it applies to everything especially school in general it's just time and repetition you have to put in the hours to learn what you want to do and it's the same with the body time and repetition with the adjustments with the exercises with being intentional about getting better and that's what it takes but yeah yeah. i was actually that's funny i was going to say like that's a perfect segue into talking about this see I think that there there's this big misunderstanding. It's a misconception when somebody's hurting or has some kind of a disorder that they need a diagnosis for. I don't know if it's if it's something going on with uh, abdominal pain, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, just a consistent dull burning. But they've but they've taken all the exams and they can't diagnose something, right? So like a functional disorder, if you will. They've they've done all the imaging. If they have uh, migraines every day, if they have persistent sinus infections, if they have you know, what me and you see more of like chronic lower back pain, mm-hmm. chronic neck pain, shoulder pain. And I, even I, when I first got into practice, I was like, yeah, you know, we want to resolve this. I want to make a big impact. We're going to diagnose it properly and we're going to resolve this. And what I started noticing is that really there's this how should we say the truth of it may be depending on the the chronic nature of the injury oftentimes Mm -hmm. the damage that's been done is we're managing it right yeah and that kind of ties back into what you're saying time and repetition yeah it's there's going to be a certain amount of frequency of care that is needed to kind of manage this Mm -hmm. because right if nothing else I, I I don't mind, you know, if you think something uh, other than my opinion on this, please, is the chiropractic adjustment, if nothing else, inhibits pain mm-hmm. at the level of the cord to then stimulate the, the, the cortex yeah. to say, you know, yeah, let's let's modulate this pain. Let's mm-hmm. change the way we perceive this pain yeah. along with all the biomechanical 
um, benefits benefits yeah. at the level of the joints that we adjust, yeah. and it's and it's just incredible because yeah. then we don't need the corticosteroids, mm-hmm. we don't need the uh, surgery quotation finger surgery that's going to fix everything yeah. because, like we see now, lots of people who have surgery continue to have pain. Uh, so we're not calling it the be all and end all. Again, just to summarize, like you just said, time and repetition. Yeah. I think that's a real important message for people to understand, especially with like these chronic injuries mm-hmm. that they never quite got over. Yeah. Um, it, it's a process. It's, it's, it's a lifelong management. Yeah. Um, oftentimes. And I just want people to know that that's kind of the truth, you know, yeah. it's a, I think it's a mentality shift from what we currently see as Western medicine mm-hmm. being, you know, symptomatic relief. And while that may be good for people, like, you know, there's plenty of patients that I've had to come in and, and treat and, you know, it's one adjustment every month or, you know, like they throw their back out every six months or whatever it may be. But I believe that, you know, prevention time and repetition is the best way to go about spinal health Mm -hmm. and overall health and wellness. Um, and you know that, like, like I put it to people, you don't have to come back every week. If that's what you think is beneficial for you, then, you know, come in and get adjusted every week. I think like for me getting adjusted once a month is perfect. Like Mm -hmm. I, I can like, that's what is beneficial for me. I think getting adjusted wouldn't hurt every month or every week, but I think I, like every every month seems to be perfect for me and I can like same same with people out there that see maybe or have that stigma of oh if I go to a chiropractor I have to go back every week. Yeah. While that may be true, like it's totally up to you. Like it if you don't want to take care of everything, like if you don't want to take care of your health, if you want to come in and just get adjusted, you know, when you feel it, that's perfectly fine, but as far as what we're trying to do, we're trying to change that perception from Western medicine, taking a pill or, you know, getting one adjustment whenever you feel your back go out, Mm -hmm. like change that and taking care of things before they get worse. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it, like, I have like the patient that comes in, you know, with lower back pain and, you know, they're used to getting a steroid injection and, you know, the pain goes away and, they think like, oh, will that fix it? Well, one adjustment isn't, same thing, one adjustment or one pill isn't going to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. You don't just take one pill, you take a series of pills. Like, don't expect your chiropractor or your doctor to do one adjustment and take care of everything. (laughs) Like, like I'm just like, I'm not a miracle worker. I want to say I'm a miracle worker, but yeah. Damn you, Dr. Ian. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's the pros and cons of everything. You know, yeah. they come in, they're like thinking one adjustment is all I need. I just need that adjustment. Like I saw on YouTube, just crack me back into place. And that's it. Yeah. I'm done. It's yeah. like, no, it happens once in a great while, but yeah, so, it definitely happens. Yeah. It definitely <laughs> happens. It's a one and done sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm just like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> like, it, like, yeah, we did good work. Today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today was a good day. <laughs> today was a good day. Yeah. That's funny. But yeah, it's, um, Yeah, it's one of those, or that, I think that's the hardest thing is just changing people's mentality to understand that one adjustment is good. But when you, when you put in the time and repetition with the exercises, the adjustments, I think that you can take care of a lot of pain without any sort of pain medication. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's just one of those deals where you have to educate patients and educate people on understanding that it's not one pill and it's not one adjustment. Yeah, man. So, yeah. You know, I, I made a video recent, uh, recently in my clinic. I've, I've been calling these segments Wisdom of the Week. Mm-hmm. And my problem is those Wisdom of the Week segments that I want to have to be about four to five minutes or yeah. like 14 minutes. Yeah. So I didn't release it. But what I, I about three months ago, I started having back pain again. And I mean, I have chronic, you know, bad discs. You probably saw mm-hmm. me in the clinic. I mean, I've been a, me- a hot mess. And, I was your lucky intern. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Taylor Davis has uh, set up and adjusted me many a times. Of course, it was always um, <laughs> his preferred Gonston. What, what do they call it? Uh, legally recorded. Yeah. What, what do we have? A patient. Uh, what do they call it? EHR. Oh yeah. yeah. It was always documented. Yeah, always documented. <laughs> so one of the the things was like I always had this mentality, much like we talked about. So I'm not gonna like beat it to death. I was like, yeah, my adjustment held. My adjustment should hold. Mm-hmm. I had this mentality that adjustment should hold. 
And what I learned recently from uh, one of my mentors is he he would say, you got to communicate to people that have these like chronic injuries. Uh, and this goes for, for anyone. Like if you're constantly dealing with something, if it's a chronic situation that's really altering your life, the uh, frequency of care that you receive of something that is effective mm-hmm. is ultimately going to be the uh, determining factor of how you feel. Yeah. And I... It's not like one day I accepted this, but I just said, I've got to do something or I'm going to fall apart. I'm going to, my back's going to explode in the clinic. It'll be an embarrassment and I'll have to close my doors and my life's over. Mm -hmm. So I started getting adjusted three times a week now for the last three weeks, maybe even a month. And exactly what he said came to fruition. And like, I have my life back. Mm -hmm. I've been running every day and it's just been incredible to see that frequency of adjustments. Yeah. You know, I I hope that people can get away with less. Like you're talking about once a month. Yeah. Once a month being your dose, yeah. uh, dose response relationship. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, other people, I hope, I hope less people are in my boat, but yeah. certainly take advantage. People, of it. yeah, people are definitely in that situation, and you know, like I actually at the at the trade days that I was at over the weekend, there was a guy that was selling uh, neuro stems. And uh, he thought I was a pain management doctor and I, uh, I got to talking to him and, uh, you know, I had, you know, some people are, have, are too far gone, if you will. And, uh, one adjustment every month is just not a reality. Uh, it may be, but some people are too far gone and yeah. for that and not saying that, you know, people out there are, I mean, there's definitely help that you can get, but it may not be you know, what you're expecting. Maybe it's not once a month. Maybe you do need or really do need one adjustment, you know, every week or mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Like pe- there are people that do require that. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like for you, it seems like you get that flare up and you need that immediate care mm-hmm. for their, uh, you know, three times a week for and, three and weeks. Now and now preventative care. Yeah, now exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and so like, and so yeah, I, again, yeah. like, we don't want to see you frequently. Obviously, like I like I tell people, I don't want to see you. I you know, like I do, but I don't. Like I want to see you for preventative care. I don't want to have you coming in every week or whatever if that's not what you need. Mm-hmm. Or you know, like you you know, yeah, like you shouldn't have to come see me every week if you don't want to. You know, like like whatever you feel is beneficial. If you're getting relief at an adjustment every month and it's holding, you know, like that's what we need to do. Yeah. And that stigma of you have to go to your chiropractor for the rest of your life, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. it is what it is, but okay. yeah. Well, without beating that to death, uh, one of the main things here now, this is why we actually you yeah. know, had you on the show. You have a really cool story within this injury. Something happened mm-hmm. to you. And I know there's an ACL injury tear in there. Mm-hmm. I know that there's, you know, the Parsonage Turner syndrome. Mm-hmm. So that's that's really, you know, what this yeah, show yeah. should be about. I yeah, think yeah. that we're going to help somebody out there who's had this. So how's that? First of all, even before you go back to where that began, how is it doing now? How's that? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I don't notice it at all, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I mean... I obviously can't externally rotate my left shoulder, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't notice it all that much. I mean, they're like, I'll go to like pick up like a five pound box or whatever with my left arm and I can't do it. And those are like the one times that I'm like, oh yeah, that shoulder doesn't work all that well. But (laughs) as far as like adjusting and like, I don't really notice it all that much to be honest with you. Like, yeah, I mean, so the ACL injury was in three years ago, maybe, um, early part of chiropractic school, you hurt your ACL. Yeah. 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 I I played basketball in college. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Parker is just like a whatever pickup game or whatever. But, uh, yeah. So I tore my ACL and then probably, well, I did this. So the surgery was like two weeks later. Um, recommendation from the orthopedic surgeon if I wanted to play golf. So, yeah, I did the surgery and I mean, that no problems other than obviously the shoulder, the knee is perfectly fine. Um, I get like some joint effusion or whatever and swelling, but it goes away. Um, and, uh, yeah, so probably I would say three weeks after, obviously I got like a huge burning sensation in my shoulder and, uh, 
thought, you know, I thought I had ended up with like frozen shoulder or whatever. And uh, so like, you know, I did some exercises or whatever and went into the orthopedic surgeon and, you know, he did like kind of a BS exam, a great doctor, but like, he just thought like I was like pinching, you know, the rotator cuff or whatever uh, with my crutches. And so he did like a little bit of like palpation, did like some orthopedic tests. And yeah. he was like, yeah, you're probably just getting like some tendonitis, uh, did a steroid injection and, uh, yeah. And the rest was history. And, uh, two weeks later I was like, you know, doing some movements and like picking up, like just flexion of the shoulder. And I was noticing that my, my elbow was kicking out on this side, on the left side. And, uh, I was like, well, that's weird. And uh, this was before, you know, all of the, like muscle testing and range of motion chiropractic school. And I was like, well, what the heck's going on? Like I wasn't putting two and two together yeah. that my internal rotators were like overactive and I couldn't hold external rotation with shoulder flexion. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the heck's going on? So I went back into the orthopedic surgeon and he was like, yeah, um, well, it sounds like you have Parsons Turner syndrome. And I was like, well, I, I recognize that phrase or that word from neurology or clinical neurology. It was like, it was real brief. We went right over it um, and didn't even cover it. Like it was in our notes, Parsons Turner syndrome, C5, C6. And that was all like, there was nothing else in our notes. And uh I got maybe there was maybe a little bit more, but that's all that I remember. And this is the same orthopedic surgeon who that did the ACL okay, surgery. All right. Yeah. So, and, oh, and, and diagnosed the shoulder uh, yeah. initially with the tendonitis. Yes. And again, like we're sure we're not knocking the guy. I'm not now because you see where I'm going with this, everybody. But he he went in, nice guy, well intentioned. How just if you remember, how long was his exam of the shoulder? Mm, like, so it was a re-exam of the knee. Uh, it was probably six maybe well probably four weeks post-op um and i was just going in for a routine checkup and i was like hey like i'm having this thing with my shoulder like i had a burning sensation i went into the er they gave me tramadol they told me like they took x-rays everything was fine oh yeah i guess i left out all that yeah. i went into the er because i woke up yeah i woke up at uh, midnight and like i could not move my shoulder like it like the worst it was worse like it made my knee feel good almost <laughs> like my shoulder was hurting so bad it was worse than like any of the knee pain and uh yeah so i went into the er they uh they took x-rays gave me tramadol told me to go back to my uh or gave me different crutches because they were like yeah same thing you're pinch like your the crutches are pinching your rotator cuff and I was like, well, like, I know that's not the case because I'm like, they're not even touching my armpits. And, and you know, it's, it's funny. It's like there's always that easy scapegoat yeah. to keep someone from critical thinking. It doesn't happen all the time, yeah. but it takes somebody who is really not going to accept that. Yeah. Like you have to be like your own advocate, as we always talk yeah. about. Uh, but anyways, continue. Yeah. yeah, like listen, like my biggest thing now is like listening to the patient and even like doc, I think it was Dr. Tam. At Parker, mm -hmm. he, uh, I had a patient come in he was like, dude, listen to the patient. And, uh, like, I kind of got mad at him at the time because I was like, dude, I'm just trying to get through this exam and get out of here. Like, you know, like, honestly, I was just like, look, like, let's just get this thing done. I'll write the treatment plan. They're going to get better with the adjustments. So they'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'll never forget that. He was like, man, listen to the patient, like, listen to what they're telling you. Like, you know, and same thing for them. I think that applies. Like if they would have listened to me, like, I, like those crutches were not compressing that rotator cuff. I mm -hmm. told them that and they were like, that's what it is. But anyways, yeah. So four weeks post-op I go and after the ER, I go back into the orthopedic surgeon and they, uh, he did maybe, maybe five minutes. They, yeah. I mean, maybe five minutes. The main reason I was there for the knee, but I told them like, Hey man, I had some pretty bad shoulder pain. Like it was bad. And, uh, I went in, actually went into the chiropractor though, too, after the ER, I went into the chiropractor and they just did like some stem, they did some activator, you mm -hmm. know, probably should have gone somewhere else, but it was all right. You know, it took care of the pain. Yeah. Um, and so I went into the, yeah, so five minute exam in and out. He was like, yeah, just some tendonitis. And, uh, you know, later on I started doing the shoulder movements, like putting through like some functional movements and figured out that I couldn't externally rotate my shoulder. And so I went back into him and he was like, all right, yeah, like you probably, you've got most likely Parsonage Turner syndrome. 
And uh, he was like, you know, there's no real fix. There's no surgery. Like you're going to get more scar tissue in your shoulder if we do surgery. Um, and so I was, you know, kind of like, well, shit. Like, what do I, <laughs> cool. I, all right. Sounds good. I guess I can externally rotate my shoulder. I was like, all right, I can't play golf anymore. I can't do this. Can't do that. Um, and so my wife at the time was working at a, uh, a uh, imaging clinic at the star, uh, the, um, blue star imaging and come to find out one of the, uh, radiologists studied under, I guess the lead researcher for Parsons Turner syndrome. And, uh, going back to the ortho, he didn't order any imaging. He was like, you have Parsons Turner syndrome. Like that's what it is. There's not going to be any fix. Is the same uh, ortho guy that did your knee that then uh, was like you might have Parsons Turner, or it sounds like it. Mm-hmm. Is he the same guy that also said the option would be to cut the sheath to let the nerve breathe, or was no, there someone different? Else? Yeah, so that's okay. going to be later on. Yeah, okay. so uh, he didn't recommend anything. He was just like, look, like I, and so as far as like how rare Parsons Turner syndrome is, he said that he probably gets, and I'm trying to think back, it wasn't any more than five patients a year that he diagnosed with Parsons Turner syndrome. So it is a fairly rare condition as far as like shoulder injuries goes, Uh, but people definitely get it out there as from what I believe um, and the research that I have seen. Um, he said that he gets about five and that's just one ortho. So you times that by a thousand orthos out there, you know, you probably get quite a bit, but um, <laughs> yeah. So they ended up doing a, a shoulder MRI. So yeah, so my wife was worked at the imaging center. So they just blast me with uh, MRIs and you know, no radiation. So I was gung ho about that. So uh, they did a shoulder MRI. They did, and then they didn't find anything and they were like, well, let's do this one brachial plexus series and see if we find something. And come to find out they found scar tissue uh, around uh, that nerve. Um, and, uh, And they were like, well, here's a referral up to a specialist in New York. That's, he's like my, the guy that I studied under, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, you can go see him. They're doing experimental surgeries, uh, to go in and cut out the, um, the scar tissue around the nerve. And, uh, you know, I thought about it and I was like, honestly, like as far as like function goes, I can do everything that I want to do. So I was kind of, you know, I was good with how my shoulder was functioning. So I didn't end up doing it. Um, and I really didn't want to go through another surgery because I'm terrified of needles. So I was like, yeah, I'm good. But I did end up before they did do the MRI. I'm just all over the place with this whole series. Um, before they did do the brachial plexus MRI, I ended up going to, um, doctor, um, he's at the star. He's another orthopedic surgeon just to get like a second opinion. And he wanted it to go in and cut out the, um, the ligament above the suprascapular notch. Uh, he wanted to go in and release, take out that uh, ligament. Mm-hmm. And he was like, that's what's going to fix it. And totally misdiagnosis. He was like, you don't have Parsons Turner syndrome. We need to go and cut out this ligament and that's going to take care of everything. Uh-huh. And he basically got into it with the uh, radiologist and he, the radiologist showed him the MRI with the scar tissue around the, uh, the nerve and he was like he called me on my cell phone and was like hey uh yeah you know you definitely have Parsons turner syndrome (laughs) like uh, i told you you didn't have you definitely have it but i still i'm gonna recommend that we go in and take out that ligament and uh, i'm just like man i'm like i'm good i can play golf i can adjust patients i can do all this stuff like i'm not doing another surgery i'm perfectly fine like yeah and, and, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's not funny. I got to stop saying that when I go into segues. But so there's an article, a uh, really uh, detailed and complete kind of article by a Joseph H. Feinberg, MD. Mm-hmm. And I was reading that uh, earlier today, kind of cramming yeah. for the exam. Yeah. yeah. So he talked about burning pain, like very overwhelming, like burning pain in the shoulder is yeah. the way it starts. Almost always following surgery, viral infection, and vaccination. Mm-hmm. And so you're fitting two of the criteria of yeah. them, of like, you know, exactly the way he describes Parsons Turner, Parsons Turner syndrome, mm-hmm. also known as diapathic brachial plexopathy, right? Yeah. And uh, they got another name for it too, like neuralgic amyotrophy. 
but they talked a lot about the uh, needle EMG, like mm-hmm. for diagnosis, yeah. and you didn't have that done. Uh, right? I did. So, yeah, so they were obviously looking in um, to the suprascapular nerve to see if that was what was affected. Mm-hmm. And so that was the two, the main diagno- diagnostic criteria was that e- the EMG that they did, and that was absolutely terrible. But yeah, I came to find out, stuck it right in the teres and the, uh, uh, the supraspinatus to check for external rotation. And yeah, it didn't, uh, yeah, it didn't help. Wow. Or the infraspinatus, sorry. The, yeah, the infraspinatus and the teres, uh, they stuck it right in there. And yep, it was, uh, it was blossom. Did not, did not work. <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah, that, that was, those were the two diagnostic criteria. And so they referred for that. And the brachial plexus MRI was kind of like the last thing to see if there was actually, so I don't know if it's that they, uh, not every case has the scar tissue or not. I think they don't find it. And so they can't just go in and with, because obviously you have like for somebody to go in, they don't just go in and scope out your shoulder for no reason, unless they have really good suspicion that they know what they're going to find. And so they had to do the MRI to be able to refer me to a surgeon to do that surgery. So I guess that's why the radiologist wanted to see if he could find the scar tissue. And he ended up finding it, which was the crazy part. He was like, dude, I didn't think I was going to find anything, but it actually like we found it. So, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, just wasn't ready to do the surgery. I could, like I said, I can golf, I can work out. I can do all of the things, you know, besides extra rotate my shoulder, you know? And it's cool. The uh, one of the other diagnostic criteria was that you said you actually had the injection for tendonitis, yeah. which is without the needle uh, EMG. Yeah, that's what they'll do. They'll treat you for tendonitis or something like adhesive capsulitis. Yeah, and then when that does doesn't not, work, or doesn't work, they'll kind of lean towards that Parsons. Yeah, treatment. that's the the biggest thing that we yeah like their differential diagnosis or, and I don't want to say them as they're bad, but yeah. like certain doctors, differential diagnosis, they'll already be treating you before they differentiate differential diagnose. Right. So like they're, they're weeding out of certain diagnoses is, well, let's treat that. If that doesn't work, we'll weed that out and we'll treat that. If that doesn't work, we'll weed that out. Mm-hmm. And you know, that may, you know, get, I mean, I don't, I guess, you know, I would rather, I'm more, I look at being a chiropractor as like an investigator and like, I like to investigate and figure out what's going on. And Mm -hmm. it's almost like a game for me. Like when a patient comes in and they're like, well, you know, this is going on. Well, okay, well, you know, let's put you through these movements. Let's see if you're flexion intolerant, extension intolerant. Let's see, you know, if you can squat, see if you have any sort of, you know, hip hinge or whatever. And like, let's put you through some functional movements to see if you can do the range of motion, if you can move. Uh, and you know, I kind of guide my treatment from there yep. rather than, you know, just having a patient doing a history and then just start treating. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, for, for certain people, I guess they just do some injections and, and it's the same thing, like for back pain, like, you know, you go into the emergency room. I have so many patients. I actually had a patient, the, it was the second month. Uh, after graduation, uh, I came in and a patient came in with severe back pain. She didn't want to get, she really didn't even want to get adjusted. Her daughter like dragged her in was like, like, just like come in, like just get adjusted and see if it helps. And she came in one time I adjusted her. She said pain from like an eight down to maybe a five or a six. Um, then I didn't see her again. And she ended up going to the emergency room. She got uh, pain medication, you know, all, all the good stuff. Yep. Um, they wanted her to do a uh, MRI. They wanted to order an MRI. And she ended up coming back in to see me uh, two weeks. And uh, she was like, well, I'm just not feeling any better. I'm just not this. I'm not that. And I'm like, here's the treatment plan that I recommended two times a week for two weeks. Let's like get you on the right path. And then we'll go from there. She came in one time, didn't come back for two weeks, and she wanted to know why she wasn't getting better. So I had to give her the whole, you know, time and repetition. We need to have you coming in. The adjustment helped. Like you told me it helped. You just, you don't want to come in. Like you Mm -hmm. either want to get better or you don't want to get better. Like there's no reason 
for them to take an MRI. She had no ridiculous symptoms. She, her pain was in extension. She was extension intolerant. Flexion was perfectly fine. So I immediately rule out disc, you know, as like disc irritation almost immediately mm -hmm. if somebody is pain and extension. Um, and yeah, like no ridiculous symptoms, no bladder dysfunction, just pain. Yeah. And, uh, the adjustment helped. She just didn't want to keep, she didn't want to come back. Yeah. <laughs> she, she was scared to get adjusted and, uh, yeah, walked her through that. She ended up coming in two times a week for two weeks and she got a lot better, but yeah. Yeah. yeah sometimes it takes, um, not just an extra nudge. I mean, it really, it's like, you never want to use a scare tactic, but you gotta be, it's not a scare tactic. You gotta be firm. Yeah. That. And like, I mean, if you're at the hospital and they're giving you anti-inflammatories, opioids, and, uh, uh, some, whatever analgesic, I'm missing one that I wanted to say, um, uh, steroids, painkillers, and muscle relaxers. <laughs> muscle relaxers. Do, yeah. <laughs> if I didn't say that. Yes. Painkillers. Okay. So, they're all getting that every time, plus some x-rays, they rule out fractures, and in this case, an MRI. Mm. And when you're not, they're, they're not getting any better. So again, the people need to understand that A, they're the only ones that are gonna heal themselves. Mm -hmm. And yes, it takes time. And you know, let the chiropractor be the facilitator. I yeah. mean, and, it, and it's, inc it's incredible that once you maybe make that breakthrough to them, that, yeah. that education, um, earn their trust yeah. and then the magic happens. Yeah. So like I, like I, we, we talked about before we started the podcast, I <clears throat> was skeptical coming out of chiropractic school, even about chiropractic in general. I thought, you know, that the adjustment did something. I didn't know what, um, and it helped people, but I didn't know how. And so I started, I started adjusting more patients once I graduated and that's all I did was adjust patients. Uh, and we worked at a high volume clinic. So it was, you know, 50, about 50 patients a day that I was seeing, um, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. And it is amazing that patients adjustments help and they get people better, but you have to you have to use the chiro like you can't just come in one time and expect everything to get better. Yep. Um, there's a lot of things that I was thinking about, you know, you asked the last chiropractor, what was like the biggest thing that like, or like the most, like the craziest, uh, case yeah. that she had. And, uh, I was actually trying to think about one that I had in the four months that I worked there. Uh, I actually had a guy that came in, he was on all sorts of, you know, all sorts of allergy medications. Uh, he was taking pain medications. Um, he had AFib, uh, his resting heart rate was, he said anywhere from 90 to hundred. Uh, and he started getting adjusted once a week. Uh, actually, so we did two times a week for two weeks. That's typically what I like to start out with, mm -hmm. um, and make sure that it's helping. If it's not helping, then refer out. Uh, but he, his resting heart rate dropped to anywhere from 60, no, uh, 50 to 60, his resting heart rate. He wasn't taking any allergy medications. Uh, he wasn't nauseous. He wasn't dizzy. He had no other symptoms of his AFib. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those are the ones that, again, keeps me curious in chiropractic. Yeah. Uh, I tend to stay pretty musculoskeletal, but those are the ones that I'm like, man, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how to like, I don't know what, how, like the adjustments help, man. Like, and when patients still come in like allergies, they got all these other symptoms, like let's give it a shot. Like it, what, like, we're just going to adjust you. Like there's not much, like we're not going to make anything worse, you know? Yeah. So. And, and that's the thing. People have this conception or they're told by other maybe healthcare professionals that, oh my God, you know, I can't believe you're going to the chiropractor. These guys are going to hurt you. Or you hear people tell a story like the chiropractor herniated my disc. No, not happening. You probably had a herniated disc that got agitated because somebody didn't adjust you with the right, you know, biomechanics. Yeah. And I mean, not to say that somebody can't be hurt with a chiropractic adjustment. Sure. You can get a sprain. You can get a strain. Yeah. You know, you can get a muscle spasm. Sure. All day. But obviously we're doing something more than like you're, yeah. you know, there's something else going on yeah. that I can't explain that keeps me interested in this every day. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. And like, that's the thing is like, I don't try to be an expert, but I'm pretty sure that when we're in neurology and we're studying all those hours we're talking about, 
about like things like um, uh, central sens sensitization mm -hmm. and temporal summation and the neuroplasticity effects and the way that we use this like pain inhibition and stimulating mm -hmm. the mechanoreceptors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that is less, especially when the cracking is happening at those yeah. joints. I think yeah. there is a tremendous amount of change in the nervous system yeah. that I just don't know if we can ever with a randomized controlled trials times whatever they whatever want to do. the numbers would be to objectively show this because yeah. everybody's physiology is unique despite all of the similarities mm -hmm. and people's underlying conditions and what they're eating and what the medications they're on you know we're going to see like inflammatory markers look you know all these different variables mm -hmm. will will um uh, impact what what the final numbers look like however we know that when someone comes off the table they're like man i can breathe better and yeah. just think about what pulling in all that extra oxygen is going to yeah. do to the, the saturation rate. Especially with wearing the masks right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never claim to be an expert. I never claim to be an internal medicine doctor. I never claim to be a neurologist. I never claim to be anything yeah. but a chiropractor. And when people ask if it can help, I can say, you know what? I guarantee you, I can find a case study where it probably helps somebody. Absolutely. So give it a shot and see if it helps. If it doesn't, I'll refer you to the, you know, to the correct medical doctor and you can go the, med the medical route. That's right. But I think there's no better, better start um, than not introducing anything into your body rather than just getting adjusted mm -hmm. uh, and treating your spine. And if that doesn't work, then obviously go the medical route. And I think it is going that way. I think that there's plenty of research coming out about back pain and spinal pain in general. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually watching um, the uh, Dr. Morgan's talk on disc herniations. And he was talking about how much research is coming out and how many hospitals are transitioning to, um, or e uh, even um, insurance companies are wanting doctors to start with chiropractic care for any sort of spinal pain mm -hmm. uh, or any sort of spinal condition, starting with a chiropractor because it saves a lot of money. And yeah. I think that is a main reason. I think a lot of medical doctors, DOs, chiropractors don't think about the money aspect, which it's a huge factor for people. And that's why a lot of people don't want to go into the doctor. It's because they think it's going to be too expensive. They can't afford it. They can't, you know, whatever. They don't have the right insurance, the right job to afford it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is a People should consider the amount of money that it does cost to go see a chiropractor or a doctor mm -hmm. and find a way to help that patient in their financial situation. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, like I always talk about us being the least invasive and most affordable. And I think that yeah. would be true across the board today. Uh, obviously, there's outliers, but I would hope that people understand just how affordable seeing a chiropractor is. And, yeah, dude. It's so know, Yeah. I mean... Yeah. 40 bucks. Like you're going to spend that. You, you, go to the emergency room. Yeah. Come to see me. Tell me what the price difference is. Right. And like, it's going to be go, astronomical. Go tell somebody like, here's my insurance card. Yeah. I take your insurance. And oftentimes it's, well, you haven't met your deductible yeah. or your copay is this, or in a couple of weeks, um, your insurance or, or they get a, actually they'll get the letter. The patient will get the letter in the mail that says it didn't cover all the, yeah. the, the, the cost. But, but not to go down that road, you know, uh, too one little, one little tidbit. Cause I have to, Yeah, please. so there's a, uh, emergency room up in Frisco. I'm not going to say the name, but I went in and got the COVID testing and my brother and sister-in-law went in to get the COVID testing. Uh, they got a bill in the mail or they didn't get a bill, but they got a, a, um, I don't know what basically it was from the, um, the emergency room saying that your insurance didn't cover it and it was three thousand dollars for the covid test yeah. and i'm just like how, like what are we doing guys? yeah i think I, I forgot like i don't want to misquote because the system that is being created allows them to say okay post whatever hours an emergent hour special visit yeah. to specialized person yeah uh specialized material and specialized masks must take into account for ppe yeah. must take into account for whatever else you're taking to account yeah. next year of three thousand billable uh, um, uh, dollars and you know the patient is either going to get uh, um, a statement where they are going to owe the balance a percentage or a lot of times because i heard the story about united healthcare you know with the ten thousand dollar antibody test they paid for all of it 
But still, like, how the fuck did they get away with a ten thousand yeah. dollar, you know, <laughs> antibody test? And United Healthcare is like, sure, go ahead, we'll yeah, pay we'll, the whole thing. Yeah, let's pay it. Yeah, I don't have no idea. It's amazing though. Yeah, yeah I. We'll see what happens with this whole COVID stuff. Yeah. I'm ready for it to be done now. I'm super excited about it to be done. I mean, honestly, it's like people are so worried about the number of cases, and I haven't. I usually won't ever talk about this, but fuck it. Is right. All these cases means two things. One is a lot less people are getting really, really sick, which means we're heading towards some avenue of herd immunity. I would hope yeah. if that's appropriate to say, I personally think that it's so we yeah. must be developing antibodies. We must be getting much less sick per person who's catching this because the viral load is decreasing uh, per anyone who may or may not still be spreading it, whatever. Yeah. And as that's going on, we're just continuing to test. So the more testing that becomes available because people are scared that they're contributing to mass amounts of fucking death, which is not the case. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a lot more of these positive cases, but what are the deaths? The deaths have gone yeah. down. Yeah, they're going down. Yeah. <sighs> I think we're headed in the right direction. Yeah. I think it's good. I just can't. I keep telling everyone it's going to be done in November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree that something's going to be uh, done. In November. Something's going to happen. Red, blue, who knows? Something's gonna happen. Yeah, I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be crazy for about two weeks after the election. Mm -hmm. Either way it goes, and then we'll be good. Yeah. I think it's gonna. Yeah, we'll see what happens. So, uh, back to the your Parsonage Turner diagnosis, mm -hmm. and you obviously didn't get a surgery. You're no. like you can still play golf, still adjust. Yeah. How did it affect your golf game? Uh, it hasn't affected it too much. So I play, I play left-handed. So my left arm is kind of my trail arm. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, it actually benefits. The only reason I say it benefits is whenever I set up to the golf ball and I take the club away into my backswing, it should be a smooth transition to your backswing and so if i can't pull my left arm and externally rotate my left shoulder it has to go slow so i can't <laughs> jerk it back so i would say that's the only way it's benefited me yeah. but it definitely hasn't hurted me i mean obviously i don't play that much um or i don't play too much anymore um so but my short game's terrible but <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it hasn't hurt i would say it's benefited me that's the only way but you know. now You've been playing golf left-handed then your whole life? Yeah. I, I yeah, I don't even remember. I uh, so like I said, I played select soccer for a long time and then in high school is when I picked up golf pretty heavily. I my parents invested quite a bit of money into golf lessons and so um, I got fairly good pretty quickly. Um uh, practice and uh, time and repetition yeah. and uh, yeah so I got good fairly quickly and uh, I uh, just always played left handed everything else is right handed besides golf I guess I bat left handed but any sort of swing yeah. is left handed which is kind of weird but yeah and had you been playing golf right handed this would have completely fucked your game up maybe I definitely I feel like would have swung slower because it would have affected my lead arm in my downswing. And so I feel like I wouldn't be able to swing as fast, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously club head speed is a big factor with golf. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting. I don't know if it would affect me or not. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be. I guess it, I don't know. I would imagine you'd. Well, certainly in the acute stage, you would have, I mean, it would have almost been impossible in the acute stage. Oh, yet, yeah. yet even a few weeks, a month after, I, I would imagine that as you were going through a particular portion of the yeah. swing is when it would have yeah, somehow impacted you. Yeah, it probably would have. Luckily, mm -hmm. I guess it was in my uh, left arm and not my right arm. I was say, God loves you. Yeah, I <laughs> guess so. He wanted me to play golf. Man, I was terrified. Like, honestly, I was terrified. I, uh, when, once I got my ACL surgery, I was like, dude, I like literally can't do anything. Like, I was like, there's no way that I'm going to be able to play golf again. There's no way I'm going to be able to run again, work out again. Like, my knee was like, it was just jacked. And, uh, like surgery is definitely for some people, like they're definitely getting better at surgery, especially uh, ACL surgeries are pretty common. So they mm -hmm. can have a lot of practice, I guess, if you want to say that, 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, my surgery went really, really well. I can play golf. I can run. I can work out. I can, you know, I did CrossFit. Like I can do everything that I want to do. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, but I was scared for a while. I was like, dude, my knee, how the heck am I going to get back to normal after the surgery? Yeah. So I can see where people do get depressed and I can see how people do get addicted to opioids. Luckily, I was in chiropractic school when I got my surgery because I what they prescribed me so much medication, <laughs> oxycodone, Percocet, like literally I was taking like, I was taking everything I was, you know, and, um, I remember Aaron and Cody were like, dude, you just got to stop taking it. I was like, dude, my knee hurts so bad. <laughs> like, how, what do you mean stop taking it? It hurts so bad. They were like, yeah, dude, you just got to like stop taking it. And I'm like, all righty, man. And it was kind of good too. Cause uh, I, and I mean, we were in neurology whenever I did my surgery. So I was so high during class. Like <laughs> I'm pretty sure people still have some pictures of me just like passed out on class mm -hmm. on oxycodone and Percocet. Uh, they prescribed me two doses of oxycodone because it wasn't working. They were like, well, let's up let's the up dose. Your dosage. Yeah, let's up the dose. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I was so high for like four days. Couldn't poop. Couldn't go to the bathroom. Like wasn't hungry. Couldn't eat. And uh, they were like, yeah, dude, just stop. And so I just stopped taking it. I actually started doing cryotherapy, uh, which I'm a fairly big advocate for now. Uh, yeah. How what, did they, did they spray you? Did your, did no, I just, just got, go in, in like a chamber? Yeah. So I got straight, I, I went straight in. Um, obviously you have to wait until the uh, incisions are healed, but yeah, I mean, as far as pain relief goes, I mean the, uh, the cold worked anyway. Like I would put ice directly on my knee and that was like the only thing that I did do for pain relief. Mm -hmm. Um, after I stopped taking the, the pain medications, but the, uh, the cryotherapy did help, um, because I mean, it gets to like negative 230 or 240. Um, and I mean, I would assume it just freaking just freezes the shit out of those nerve endings. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it helped temporarily. I'd say, I mean, the ice, you obviously have to continuously do, yeah. but the cryotherapy, I feel like it helped maybe three to four days. Um, once I did it, I, you know, the pain definitely decreased in that amount of time. So I did it like once a week for a little while. And, um, and your whole body was inside the chamber. Yeah. So okay. you just get in a whole tank. Yeah. For how long? Uh, I think they, two and a half minutes. Okay. So like, yeah, you're in there like moving around, like trying to get moving. But yeah, so that's another reason, like one of, like we have three pillars in my clinic. We have chiropractic rehab and recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kirk definitely got me into the recovery aspect uh, for athletes. And I think that as I watched, I was watching the video uh, this morning, LeBron James, $1.5 million on um, recovery. And so that's one of our pillars in our clinic is going to be recovery, uh, obviously, once we get going and can afford the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do want to provide athletes uh, a place to come and focus on recovery, uh, doing the norm attacks, doing the uh, percussive therapy, doing the, uh, the cryotherapy, all that stuff, yeah. uh, focusing on recovering and keeping them healthy, yeah, uh, yeah. I think is a huge aspect of sports that oftentimes gets ignored almost. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I never focused on it. I was never worried about recovery uh, when I played golf and soccer. I mean, soccer, you're literally running probably five miles in a game. And, you know, like I definitely would have played better, I feel like, if I had some sort of recovery. But yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and Dr. Nikki Kirk, for those that don't know, this guy's a guru when it comes to sports rehab and, you know, running and uh, training. I mean, he was very influential, actually, early on in a case that I had. I called him up and sought some in, um, advice, insight, yeah. excuse me, and it helped tremendously. Yeah. 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 He, I mean, he kind of, he, I mean, yeah, he got me into the recovery aspect of chiropractic. I didn't even, I mean, like, I didn't realize that there was a sports side of chiropractic, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like my, fa I guess fa if you want to say our family chiropractor, um, he didn't do too much like active therapy in his clinic. It was really just like, I guess the term family chiropractor is really yeah. big. Uh, and so he, you know, was fairly straight chiropractor. He did like the, you know, the intersegmental traction and the, the tens units of the interferential. Right. And then he did the adjustments and some soft tissue work. Um, so I wasn't really exposed to that, to that. Mm -hmm. and even the, the, 
chiropractor that I went to in school for my shoulder didn't do rehab or recover like anything like that either. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of a big, um, I guess, you know, proponent or like, like he spoke highly of doing rehab and recovery as well as chiropractic. And that's kind of how I've modeled my clinic. Um, after him is incorporating that recovery aspect and helping athletes stay healthy through the season. So yeah, I would say he's definitely a fairly big guru. I'm never going to tell him he's a guru just, you know, because I like to give him shit. But yeah. besides that, yeah, I would say he's definitely a very smart, uh, person when it comes, very smart doctor when it comes to neurology and recovery. So yeah, who loves to bust balls yeah. <laughs> and play around, and make jokes, and really creates a great environment for feeling, you know, for students especially to feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, yeah, he definitely helped. I mean, I remember the one. There was one case where uh, I would, I think it was my first like walk-in patient or whatever, uh, and it was a uh, came in with a, a calf strain. And, and he literally, we, uh, it was a Spanish speaking patient. So he came in and helped me with the, like the, the report of findings and everything. Uh, but before that, uh, he made me write out this treatment plan for this patient's calf. And he, uh, he literally told the patient like, yeah, you're going to be fine. You don't need to come back. You just need to let it heal. But he never told me that while I was writing the treatment plan. So I read this whole treatment plan, put in like all this effort <laughs> and uh, he made me write this like full on treatment plan. And he was like, yeah, she's not coming back, man. Like I told him she'll be fine in 14 days. <laughs> and so I had this treatment plan. I'm like, well, what the heck am I going to do with this treatment plan? Then he was like, well, I guess it was good practice. <laughs> that was my uh, first, yeah, interesting if you, if you want to graduate, get used to it, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. It was, yeah, it was, he was, yeah, he was definitely influential when it came to all that stuff. But yeah, it was fun working under him. I definitely, definitely never a dull moment, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, another tidbit, I don't know if I told you or not, but I had never been adjusted prior to going to chiropractic school. I think I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah, never got adjusted. You're part of that subset where guys like me who had been adjusted for 10 years and were like, chiropractic is a miracle. Yeah. When you come in, they're not getting adjusted. I'm yeah. like, what the fuck? Yeah, the, the first, the, uh, the first, um, I guess, like the first adjustments that I got were uh, actually activator uh, or like, I guess, torque release technique. But he also did like manual adjustments in my uh, thoracic spine and drops in my pelvis, um, and that was like the only, that was like the one like I still knock activator and I always will knock activator. But I will say that um, the little bit of pain that I do remember having in my lower back pain from just like sitting in class, mm -hmm. um, I definitely didn't notice as much when he was adjusting me every week. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, some people love activator. I like more of a manual adjustment, but that was the first, the first adjustment that I did get was activator and drops. Mm -hmm. And I don't do really any of that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the one exposure that I did get to that, I don't do, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean it, it, uh, I mean, I'll use, I guess drops every now and then, but I definitely like to hear things crack yeah. like you do on YouTube. Yeah. And I have been doing um, a modified, I can't say ring dinger, I guess he has it like like trademark now, right. but uh, I definitely do like some high velocity decompression now in the uh, cervical spine. Things aren't like clearing up like they, I, like I think they should. Yeah. I'll definitely do some like uh, high velocity uh, decompression and people are like, what in the world was that? <laughs> and they're like, dude, that is amazing. But uh, yeah, yeah, I don't do it on everyone. Um, yeah, you know, as you know, we wouldn't do that in my clinic. No, but uh, you know, <laughs> but definitely there is a, a time and a place for that manual fast twitch decompression therapy, intersegmental yeah. disc uh, decompression. Yeah, yes, sir. Do you know Doctor Zev Melman over in Florida? I don't. So this Gonsta? Is, no, he's not a Gonsta no. doctor. He you know does everything. He's got. I put it this way, whatever his technique of choice is, mm -hmm. it's reminiscent of all the different things that we've done in school and he kind of made his own thing. But the way he moves extremities, I am like, I'm just in awe of. Really? So, yeah. Oh man, really amazing adjustments. Like when he's isolating that calcaneus and he's moving the foot around and he's got the, all these various angles where he's dentist for navicular, this one's cuboid. And you see the way that he's like, you know, making that fib head sing. I'm like, man, yeah. I just want to take a trip to Florida and have this guy kind of teach me how to do, you know, extremities like on that level. He's semi, he does seminars or no? 
I don't know. I got to reach out and, and oh, see. Yeah. yeah, he's 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 big on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, I'm not even gonna lie. I, I modeled my like website where uh-huh. I call it like Doctor Perlman TV because yeah. he has this Doctor Zev TV. Oh, really? And I was like, yeah, if people are watching me on a screen, that's you know television. I was yeah. like, I'm just gonna call it Doctor Perlman TV. Yeah. I mean, I do Gonstead. He does you know a much more full spine approach, but I can say like a his patients love him. B I think his his style's fantastic. And the extremities in particular, I'm like really into what he's doing over there mm-hmm. because, you know, my, my spinal adjusting is working the way I want it to work. Mm-hmm. Always learning, always evolving, of course, but I, I really want to see what he's doing with extremities. Yeah, we had one, um, we had a patient come in that uh, his wrist extensions probably maybe 15 degrees, maybe 15 degrees. And he worked as a meat cutter and, uh, that was, I guess this was another really extreme case. He, uh, he broke his wrist, uh, like way back when he had no, no idea, like what bones he fractured. I would assume probably scaphoid. Uh, but yeah, so he fractured his wrist and, uh, he came in less than 15 degrees of wrist extension. We started adjusting his wrist. He had, he had 30 degrees visually. He probably had 30 degrees within three or four visits. Wow. It was crazy. I was like, dude, I'm like, honestly, I'm like, I don't know what, like, this was a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. I was expecting, you know, maybe like probably six months of like real, like real care. Uh, but yeah, the adjustments, like he gained 15, 20 degrees like that. So that's like spinal adjustments plus just moving the carpal bones in his wrist. Yeah, we did. So yeah, I mean, it was at the joint. So I did full, it was full spine. Yeah. Um, I did... Uh, yeah, full spine adjustments, and then we did shoulder, elbow, and then I adjusted the wrist. Yeah. And typically, I, um, I definitely not like a specific chiropractor. I like to move everything, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, we adjusted everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, like 15, 20 degrees within like four visits. It was crazy. I was like, dude, this is nuts, man. <laughs> and I was like, let's keep going. Like, let's keep doing it. But uh, yeah, I can't take all the credit. Dr. Mike C was working with me. He actually started, he he brought him on um, and I adjusted him a couple times as well. But yeah, it was crazy how quickly he got better with just, with just adjustments. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and that, that's the amazing thing. It's how fast people respond. We're not saying how fast they get better, everybody, but how yeah. fast they respond. Yeah. And you're like, holy shit, we're making progress. And then you got to figure out the right medicine, the yeah. sequence and pattern and the um, consistency, yeah. um, frequency. Yep. I'll tell you what, so before we end up going too, too far and carrying on too much, which I could do for hours and days, um, is there resolution? Like, is, is that nerve ever going to get fixed? Like, is there something that could somehow spontaneously, if you will, come back? Yeah, so we, um, so I do neurodynamics, which is a, uh, for for doctors, it's just a upper limb tension test, just like in the upper extremity and the lower extremity, it's slumps and SLR. Um, for people that don't understand what that means, it's basically uh, putting tension on nerves uh, and mobilizing the arms and the legs to put tension on those nerves. And this part of it is what I do is specific and figuring out is it the radial nerve is it the ulnar nerve is it the median nerve is it the common peroneal nerve is it the tibial nerve what's causing uh the tension and what um and actually it was dr dmac that got me into it uh the seminar uh that michael shacklock puts on Mm -hmm. is he calls it neurodynamics but he does a bunch of cadaver studies and he does these tests on the cadavers and he's finding that there's like almost an inch of movement in the nerves. And so uh, he has a specialized course where he can go in and mobilize um, the suprascapular nerve. And uh, I think that that may help, uh, but I don't know if that would fix it. But mm-hmm. I think that that is the one thing that I've been um that I've been told about that could help that I'm interested in trying. Yeah. Uh, but it's just when I get the time and when he's in this area. Yeah. So, but no other, like the orthopedic surgeon, no, no offer of surgery. Um, the second orthopedic surgeon that I went to that 
misdiagnosed me. Uh, he wanted to cut out that uh, suprascapular notch ligament. Um, and then the um, radiologist referred me up to that uh, Parsons Turner specialist. Mm -hmm. But the out of pocket was like, I think 10,000 to do the surgery because it was considered a experimental surgery. Yeah. So insurance wouldn't cover it. So I had to pay like all the out of pocket. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, I like, it's not tell like I can do everything I want to do. I'm not paying 10 grand yeah. for some guy to do an experimental surgery that he doesn't even know it's going to help. So yeah, I want to try the neurodynamics. Um, I do it already um, on uh, patients that do have like extremity symptoms uh, or like any sort of, I can't say nerve pain, but, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> or, uh, but yeah, so I'm going to try neurodynamics for the, uh, for that nerve and see if that helps. But, nice. uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if he's ever in the area. He's always like, yeah, we'll see if he's in the area for that secondary course. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Cool, man. And where now I'm going to put it in the intro or it says in the intro, but really tell everybody like, where can they find you? Yeah. And uh, what do you, and, and just kind of emphasize like exactly what, what it looks like at your clinic. Let's get a visual. So, uh, you can find us at Davis spine and sport. We have a Instagram, Facebook page. Uh, our email is front desk at Davis spine and sport.com. Um, if you're looking for a sports chiropractor that does, um, a, if you're looking for to get everything adjusted, we're gonna move, I move everything. Um, yeah, that's kind of what uh, our clinic is modeled after, uh, more of a full spine diversified adjusting. Uh, we're located off of 380 in Stonebridge and McKinney, davisspineandsport.com. Um, I think I talked about it before, but like our, my main goal is to get everybody adjusted in our clinic. Uh, if they need to do some sort of rehabilitation uh, and then recovery for athletes. Um, those are our kind of three pillars. So. And are you going to have anything like, uh, are you going to have decompression? Are you going to have uh, cryotherapy in your office? Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks COVID. But uh, yeah, we were, we are going to have decompression. Okay. Um, we're, that's been on hold just because of the equipment. Yep. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll eventually have decompression. Uh, we've been looking at a few different units, but they're all, I, I'm pretty sure there's, back order or whatever they call it. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've, we'll have, so whenever you come into our office, um, we're going to be doing functional movement screenings, orthopedic tests, neurological tests. Um, and then every patient obviously will get adjusted on the first visit. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have intersegmental traction roller tables. So my, obviously, uh, the chiropractor, the family chiropractor that I went to, I modeled my clinic obviously after his as well. Mm -hmm. So we do do uh, the intersegmental traction tables, um, the Russian stem, interferential stem combo, uh, all that stuff. And then we have an exercise room that will eventually be converted over to the recovery room yeah. uh, where we'll have like the cryotherapy, the Norma text, the percussive therapy stuff, all that good stuff, stretching stuff, yeah. like rehab equipment, all that good stuff. So Dude, I'm super stoked. I'm happy know. for you. I I'm know, excited. Man. Can't yeah. wait to see it. October 5th. It's coming in soon. It's oh, coming. Man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And then the baby right after. Yep, the baby right after. Like I said, <laughs> October is huge, man. It's going to be a crazy month, but yeah. we're excited and we're uh, man. I'm just I'm I'm excited to get out and uh, and start helping patients in my own clinic yeah. uh, and kind of doing things how I would want to do them. Um, there are too many patients. Not I can't say too many patients, but there are a lot of patients that did get a lot better. I think I could have gotten them better faster with some exercises. Yeah. Um, there's so many patients that are like, Oh yeah, I'll do these exercises. And then they come in like, they're, they're not going to do them. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing. Like once you're your own boss, so like once you're out of that associate ship and you know, yeah. you now start coming October 5th doing your own thing. I yeah. mean, you're going to see your patients will probably, I mean, almost always respond at the rate into which not only that you educate them, but yeah. like, you now are in control of that rather right. than whatever sort of a bureaucracy ladder that exists yeah. with, within another uh, company that's yeah. not yours. Yeah. You yeah. have to, whatever that, I mean, you treat <laughs> on that doctor's terms. Yeah. Um, and I've always said like, I, there's plenty of good associateships out there and I hope that, you know, coming out of school, there really isn't a very good like transition from, you know, school to becoming an associate to owning your own practice. I think it's getting better, 
but they're already so like almost like branded like you either yeah. go with integrity doctors or you go with an amp doctor or you go with this doctor or yeah. max living yeah. like there's it's, it's hard to find a doctor out there that's willing to give you a decent salary for your doctorate degree yeah. and so that's one thing that i hope to accomplish is providing somewhere for doctors or a doctor to come and make a decent living if that if they don't want to open up their own practice pay them a decent salary and give them the opportunity to help patients how they want to yeah. um and not have to like you know just work to death and not make anything it's that's that's i i hate seeing like people like work a lot and not you know benefit yeah. from their doctorate degree i think that's crazy yeah. yeah for sure but anyways i gotta give you a shout out you know you were one of the first people that introduced me to like when i watch you doing intermittent fasting before, oh yeah before i even started my keto journey we didn't even touch on that yeah yeah uh, i can't say that i'm in the best shape right now because my wife but uh <laughs> i have to blame her a little bit uh just because yeah She's pregnant, but, um, yeah, man, I gotta, I'm getting back on that. We took, uh, our, uh, uh, maternity pictures yesterday and I was like, babe, I'm fat. <laughs> I, need to lose, I gotta lose some weight. I was like, it can't be that fat dad. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm about to kick it into gear today. Today's Monday. I'm, yeah, I'm going to be that guy that's like, oh yeah, it's a new week. New week, new me. <laughs> new, year, new year's resolution came early. <laughs> yeah. Before the clinic, before the baby. Yeah. So I gotta, yeah. Uh, the intermittent fasting, I, uh, when we, when I was in school, it is good, man. Like, I would fast basically from sundown to noon. Yeah. And, uh, the one reason that I liked it was I could eat, like I could eat more in a short period of time so I could get full. And so like when I just have breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, mm -hmm. like I would never feel satisfied or get full. That was one thing that I liked about intermittent fasting that I could obviously like somewhat eat what I want, but I could definitely get full. Yeah. And that was one thing for me that like I tried keto and uh, obviously, like you're a huge proponent for keto, yeah, but uh, I just couldn't get that much fat, man. I could, I couldn't even have much fat. I, like I like avocado, I like the eggs, but so much of that, I don't know. I just got burnt out, I guess. I'll give you my keto manual. I'll, I'll be printing it out here before you leave. All right. Um, you see if that's like, oh, I didn't know you could do this, or oh, I never thought of that. All right. And I think that'll help. I mean, if someone really wanted to, go I'm keto. yeah, I'm better at. If you just give me something to do, I'll just do that. Like yeah. exercises. That's why I like CrossFit. Cause like I could, like I didn't have to think about it. I could just like, like get my car, drink my pre-workout, go to CrossFit. And then there was a workout and I did it and I left. Yeah. Like rather than just like going to the gym and I'm like, all right. Figuring so it's Monday. Doing. I'm going to do back and biceps. <laughs> um, all right. Why? Well, like, all right, let's just do these four and like these three or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm, I need to just, just give me something. I'll just do that. Yeah. Are you still crossfitting? No, I stopped doing it. Um, uh, I just didn't want to pay the money to do it anymore. <laughs> like I love CrossFit. I know people not CrossFit. Like I did get back pain. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but it subsided and like I probably after two weeks of doing it, like I was perfectly fine. I could, mm -hmm. you know, pick my weight that I did do the snatches, do the cleans, do the, you know, clean and jerks, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't lie. I did get back pain, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it went away pretty quickly. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, even if, I mean, I think CrossFit's absolutely amazing and yeah. not even, and I won't even make the joke. Oh, it's great for chiro chiropractors and physical therapists. Yeah. No, it's just literally just the, the, the risk, the um, frequency in which people get injured. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's just, it's not worth it. You yeah, know, obviously yeah. now for YouTube coming October 5th, that's yeah. going to be the biggest thing. It's yeah. Just I know. The care so, we need. Yeah. I, um, uh, my risks are the worst. Like I, uh, like I get some pretty bad neuropathy, neuropathy in my uh, radial nerve and like, I literally can't adjust. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to like change my technique. I do more of a Gonstead adjustment in the thoracic spine. Cause I literally can't like do like a mm -hmm. double Pisi or, you know, double thena or whatever. I just do a gaunt. I literally gauntlet adjustment. And that's what I do. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Brittany McGentrick, McGentrick, excuse me, how I butchered her name yeah. on the last <laughs> podcast. Brittany, I am so sorry. And here we are an hour and 20 minutes into this one. And I'm yeah. finally apologizing for saying your name wrong when I introduced you, but I put a disclaimer on and there you know, know. we're, we're learning as we go here. Uh, <laughs> the dyslexic guy who has a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she talked about the, 
pain in her wrist consistently yeah. through chiropractic school. And this doctor thought it was all due to a zinc deficiency. Uh-huh. But that was when she was like a vegetarian, not eating a lot of red meat. And it was adding the red meat frequently in her diet that she felt uh, started to make her wrist feel better. Mm-hmm. And then it was going full carnivore that yeah. basically eliminated her joint pain. I did the carnivore. I did do the carnivore because Joe Rogan did it. Okay. He did it. I don't want to, maybe a month or something. Yeah. I did try it. It was just expensive. Really? Like okay. getting the meat and everything. Yeah. And it's funny you say that. So I'm, I, I'm not going carnivore now. Not even going to pretend that I'm carnivore, Yeah. but I'm going a lot more animal based keto yeah. now in the last two weeks. And it's actually been much less expensive than when I was doing the plant-based keto. Oh, really? But that also because my bias and I want to go to Whole Foods and get everything that I think is like the most healthy organic. Yeah, the good stuff or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But being able to buy the the ground lamb, the ground beef, some of the the liver and chicken backs and Uh things like that have have helped substantially. Whereas like when I was buying those cucumbers and all the macadamia nuts. I mean, the the nuts add up though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the nuts are expensive, man. I went to go buy pine nuts, like 10 bucks for like a little. (laughs) I was like, what the? What are you doing? Dude, 10 bucks? Brazil nuts, yeah. pine nuts. Like, uh, holy shit, oh dude. Guys. What are we, like, literally a little thing of pine nuts was 10 bucks. I was like, babe, I, I gotta go to Sprouts. Like, this is too expensive. That or, we need to start fucking making a little garden in our backyard and start planting some seeds. And- or I need to start selling nuts. <laughs> Jeez Louise, man. Figure it out. Yeah. yeah. We got, that's another one. We gotta, we gotta get some nice residual income. Yeah. Selling nuts at discounted prices. Yeah. Make Whole Foods bring down <laughs> theirs to stay in a, a competitive environment. Yeah, for real. For real, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, quick shout out while we got this. We talked about cryotherapy. Uh, Lori over there at the Glow Shop in Denton. I know you've got that. Uh, or If you don't have it yet, I know you're having it soon. She's one of the best people I know. So if you need that cryotherapy, guys, if oh. you, if you know, reach out to her at the Glow Shop. And uh yeah, man. Is there anything else? Anything that the people should know before we before we end this for the day? That's it, man. It was good seeing you. Yeah. I know it's been a while. I went to go see Steven and uh, I'll have to yeah. do it again. Mm-hmm. No, I finally got that thing that was in my mouth like way early in the morning <laughs> when I was playing when I was making the coffee. But goddamn, Michael, this is some good coffee. Yeah, I know. I like I said, I'm pretty sure I already said it, but yeah, way no, better no, than no, Costco you coffee. Did, you did. <laughs> really, no, thank you. And uh, yeah, man. Taylor. Best of luck. I hope I see you a lot more than even, you know, once in a great while to do a podcast. I'll be checking out your clinic. Yeah, dude. And thanks for all you do. Come on, man. And uh, until next time, everybody. Yes, sir. Stay tuned.